Okay, we're at 32. So thank you everyone. We're so glad you're here joining us. Um, we've got a lot of people on the call today, so we're not gonna go around the room for introductions, but feel free to drop your name and your affiliation in the chat if you'd like to. Um, we are, there's a number of us here today that participated in the Palouse Clearwater Food Summit a couple of weeks ago. So we're going to share some information about that as well. Um, before we dive into the discussion, I want to let Katie do some general housekeeping. Thanks everybody for joining us today. Just some general housekeeping. I think we're all familiar with most of these. Um, if you could just make sure your microphone is muted um, and just control background noise when you are speaking to the best of your ability. Feel free to type any questions that you have into the chat box. I'll help moderate the, that chat box and make sure that we answer your questions. And then you can also raise your hand. So when we open it up for discussion, feel free to raise your little hand icon and we'll call on you. Um, if you have any follow-up questions, please email hello at fairidaho.org. I'll also put that email into the chat box for quick reference. Thank you, Katie. Next slide. Okay, so um, my name is Amy Mateus. I am the program director for the Sun Valley Institute for Resilience. I'm also on the Fair Idaho board and I chair our farm and agriculture committee. Uh, we're doing a lot of work around livestock processing. This round table is part of that work. So the conversation we have today will help to direct our organization and the work we're moving towards this coming year. Um, let's see, we also have Colette de Phelps on. So I'll let her introduce herself. Hi everyone, I'm Colette B. Phelps with the University of Idaho Extension. I serve the 10 Northern counties of Idaho and I work with FAIR Idaho as an advisor and I chair the Palouse Clearwater Food Coalition. We've had a lot of conversations around livestock processing in the past 20 years in our region. And I'm really excited to have FAIR Idaho as a partner working in this space. And there's so many producers on here today. Thank you for joining us. So it's really awesome. And I guess I can introduce myself. Um, my name is Katie Baker. I'm the executive director of FAIR Idaho. FAIR stands for Food, Agriculture, Restaurants, and Establishments. We are a nonprofit trade association that represents independent food and beverage businesses across the state of Idaho. So it's really everything from field to fork. So we represent farmers, ranchers, food and beverage producers, independent restaurants, independent beverage establishments, and retailers. So thanks so much. I'm so excited for this conversation today and learn more. Thanks, Katie. Okay, so there's next slide. So as I mentioned briefly, Katie and I co-facilitated a breakout session at the Palouse Clearwater Food Summit earlier this month. It was a really exciting conversation to be part of, and there were some major needs identified in that. Um, the big takeaway was that large animal USDA processing facilities, there, there's not enough up there to serve the Palouse Clearwater North Idaho Western Washington region. Um, there was conversation about new and expanded services. If there was going to be some new services that were seeking grant funding, could we get letters of support to show needs from our producers in the region? There was also some expression of needing support in said grant writing to tap into some of the federal dollars available. A couple people mentioned entrepreneurs that might be interested. I think we have someone on the call today who's an entrepreneur who's interested that will have an opportunity to hear from as well. Um, people express like the need for tapping into capital, whether that's federal grants, private equity, investment dollars, angel investors, et cetera, um, and building more cohesion with the producers in the region. So we are, this is kind of the baseline for our conversation today. And this, these are the next steps that we'd like to take um, one of the things I wanted to share with everyone is some financial resources that are available currently or are coming online in the next couple months. Um, this is really important for us to take advantage of the federal dollars that are available as well as that private equity stuff. 
So one thing that is live currently is the food supply chain guaranteed loan program that happens through lenders. So your farm bureaus, um, private banks, institution, commercial banks, things like that. Any lender that's in the United States can apply to become a guaranteed loan program lender if they're not already. There is um, $1.4 billion of funds available in that. So basically it's still, there's interest on it. You'll have to pay it back. It's not a grant, but it gives a little security to the lenders to say like the federal government backs these loans so they can lend to more risky business models. Um, 19% of those funds are reserved for work in the slaughter and processing facilities. That expires, that 19% um, expires on June 7th. And if it's not all accounted for, it will be diverted to other programs. So if you're in operation or wanting to start a business, this is definitely something that could help um, you get some capital needs and some low interest loans and support. Earlier this year, we saw the meat and poultry inspection readiness grant. So that is a grant, so not a repaid loan. Um, they, the period was over, I think in August of this year, but we're anticipating round two to be announced this spring. Um, this is mostly for existing processors that are either custom exempt or USDA inspected to expand or upgrade their facilities. So that's a great one for those existing businesses. We'll also see, um, many of you may have heard that the Biden administration is allocating $1 billion of investment into this sector. Um, so one of the things that we're watching for is those announcements of when those funds are available. So we do know that we will see a couple hundred million um, this spring for those expansion programs and gap financing, another lending program coming in the summer, and then we will, we will eventually see workforce development and innovation and technical assistance funding, but those dates have not yet been announced. Um, so while I wish I could share more details about those programs, they're not yet live, but one thing that I love about Fair Idaho is as soon as that information is available, we share that out with you. And if you're registered today for the webinar, you're now officially on the newsletter list for FAIR. So be on the lookout for those announcements when they come. And I'm gonna plug my organization quickly because one of the things that we do is that we have an impact investing fund. So we have interested donors and investors who want to support the livestock, meat processing, re regional agriculture and food system sector. Um, and we are currently still accepting applications for projects. Um, we had a good original, like 450,000 available and we're looking to raise more money in this coming year to fund even more projects. So if that's something you're interested in, we can talk at a later date about that or further along in this um, discussion today. So now I wanna jump into the really exciting stuff about some of the opportunities that we saw brought to the table during our um, breakout session at the Palouse Clearwater Food Summit. So the first we'd like to, I think I saw Katie on the call, Katie Swaint, if you're on, um, you're welcome to unmute and introduce yourself and share a little bit about the opportunity that you're working on. Hi, uh, my name is Katie Swant. For those who don't know me, I'm a small bison rancher up in Tinsit, Idaho, and I was at the last meeting and we talked about the need, uh, I think, especially for poultry and then for bison. Um, but we actually got lucky and found four friends, which I saw was on the call. Um, so <laughs> kind of helped us out there. But uh, I know that there's been some other people in contact with me about needs for processing in the Palouse area. Um, so I was looking at some mobile setups. Uh, I found a couple companies that do mobile processing units and depending on need, um, we've got two different size units. So one, you know, a smaller unit, which does about a max of seven beef carcasses in the cooler at a time. And then another one uh, that's a little bigger that does about 15 head of beef at a time. Um, so I know it's not a huge facility because uh, some of the people that have been talking to me you know, I know in the fall when everyone needs to process, uh, it's going to get a bit overwhelming. Um, but, you know, our goal would be to help alleviate some of that. 
uh, and try to get a mobile processor out there as well, just so people out in the middle of nowhere can have access to processing. Um, and then also, I kind of like the model of a mobile processing because it's a lot less stress on the animal versus carting them off um, hours away to a processing site. Um, so that way they can just, you know, that happens in the field, um, which is, I think, a little more ethical. Um, so what I need uh, for people in the Palouse, and I can put my email in the chat, is first, you know, with any business, we need a need. Um, so I have a little bit of background. I took entrepreneurship courses getting out of the Navy. I did 10 years in the Navy. Uh, and then I just finishing up the last of my accounting and agricultural economics classes at University of Idaho. Um, so I'm, I feel like I have the background knowledge enough to, to do something like this. Um, so what I need from people in the Palouse area is, you know, I'm going to start an email list serve, but I need you know, commitments from people that need, have a need for this processing so I can actually build the business plan for it, make sure that it is going to be viable. Um, Cause I don't, you know, nobody wants to start a business and watch it fail. Uh, so that, and depending on what kind of need we need, uh, I can design the facility to be, to try to meet as many people um, in the plus as possible for that, for that gapped need. So that's kind of what I need for today. So I can start building that. Thank you, Katie. Um, I think we had one question come in specifically and I'll let you answer that. Is this gonna be a USDA inspected facility? Uh, I found two companies, the two that I found, cause I found a lot of companies. These two actually do FSCI, F, the USDA inspectable uh, facility. So it will be USDA um, inspected. Great, thank you for that. So I think what we would love to hear, whether it's in the chat or people coming off mute, um, is this an opportunity that you're interested in? If so, can you connect with Katie to provide some of that need, some of the volume and seasonality fluxes available um, within the producer cohort on this call today? So if you, okay, I see Jacqueline raising her hand. So Katie, there's a, a young, a man and his brother have just purchased um, Heights Market. And then his brother has been doing the mobile unit. Um, and they are, the mobile unit he's been doing for about a year and a half with uh, Frank, who owned Heights Market. And his brother just purchased it from him. And he couldn't be on the call because he's still trying to finish up and move his family up here. Um, but if I get him your information, um, that would be a good resource for you. They're young and motivated um, and they do a really good job with our our cattle that, because I like them also to be butchered here um, on site. So if we could get a USDA, that would be wonderful. So I will share their contact information with you. Okay, thank you. I think we saw another question come in. Um, will you, well, okay, will you handle lamb? Will you also handle chicken, goat, sheep, cattle? Um, I'll let you answer that one first, Katie. And I don't know if you have the answer or if that's something you're vetting and you're um, understanding the needs. Uh, yes, um, we want to do poultry as well. I know there's not really a lot of people out here that do poultry. Um, it creates a little more of a planning. Um, so as we'll have to switch out, usually they're loaded up for either poultry or everything else. Um, so we're working with, the uh, I've called the two companies and we can work with that to make sure we have both poultry and uh, other animals. But yes, we want to make sure we can do anything from sheep, goat to bison to cow um, to chickens, you know, so we're, because since this is going to be a community thing, we want to make sure that we can service as much as a community as we can. So wonderful. And then a second part of that question, will you be able to have organic inspected meat? I don't have the answer to that right now, but I will look into that, so. Okay, so you would be willing to offer that if it's feasible and people have, are interested. Okay, um, I don't know if you can answer this yet. It might be a little further along than where you're at with the planning process, but do you know where you're getting the USDA inspector from? Uh, not yet. I Right now, okay. I just am trying to get establish that need. And then also I forgot to mention what, you know, when people are talking to me with what they need, um, 
you know, I, I know some of the equipment is more specialized. So if you want uh, value added processing like sausages and stuff, I need to know that. So, because we're going to design this facility from scratch and we have a very limited amount of space. Um, so I'm going to try to maximize community needs as possible. Um, so that's why, yeah, just reach out to you with email with your needs, um, what you want to see, and I will build the most best facility to try to meet everybody's needs as possible. Um, yeah, did that answer the question? Yeah, I think so. And I am just to share with you what's going on in the chat as people are saying that if there was a USDA processor to salt, serve poultry producers, they think there would be a lot more production of poultry. So it seems like there is an opportunity there. Um, yeah. And the poultry, I, I also like, you know, the fact that it'll help in our off season. So I know most beef and stuff is going to be in the fall or maybe spring right before farmer's market. And that poultry can kind of service that that blank space because the last thing we want to do is train up a couple butchers and then not be able to pay them year round. Um, so we want to make mm -hmm. sure not only are we taking care of the police needs, we're taking care of our employees needs as well. Um, so yep. we need to make sure that we have business year round. So. Okay, thank you. And then um, someone is asking if you are willing to share what are the names of the two companies you're referring to? Um, they're not in the Palouse, but are interested in mobile processing in Northeast Washington. Sure. Um, so the, these trying to pull it up here. The smaller company is, uh, it was mobile processing. Um, my computer. Hi. It was mobileprocessingplant.com. Um, uh, they had a smaller USDA. They focus more on poultry, but they do a beef one. And then Friesla is the uh, nicer, larger one. It is also the much more expensive one. Um, so they, they both companies are about uh, six months lead time right now. And the Frieza one runs about $700,000. Um, so it is, it's a bit much, but you know, with the grant or something, we would definitely be able to get that. Um, but yeah, those are the two companies I found that were willing to do the USDA and were um, pretty good at communicating back, so. All right, thank you for that. Um, someone made a comment that pigs are also not as se seasonal as beef or lamb. So that can be a consideration when looking at um, the availability and volume needs. Um, someone also said that poultry, some people are driving all the way to the Boise area to process. So that seems like a big need. Um, someone is asking, Katie, if you've spoken with anyone from USDA about the challenges or requirements for a mobile slaughter unit. So the biggest challenge is get you know getting your uh, some of it is the sites themselves. So I know there's certain requirements. You know we have to have make sure we have you know if it's a mobile site we have to have bathroom facilities. And I don't know if these they the plans didn't come with bathrooms. So I may have to try to you know work with that. But uh, the the inspector's got to have a place to go. So that's kind of something that you know if we're going out on field it could be a potential problem. Um, and then the HACCP's the biggest one, um, but the Friesla actually will send trainers. So it's kind of why it's a little more expensive, but uh, they will send people out to train you, train you on the unit. And then they also help you walk through that HACCP. I've built a couple HACCPs here locally. Um, so I've got some familiarity, but I know it's a much bigger monster for the USDA. Um, but they are, they go with through that process with you. Um, so I, I kind of liked that with that company. So. Yeah. That sounds like a great service. Um, and then someone's asking, would it make sense to separate the truck used to slaughter from a facility that processes the meat into store ready format? So like, I'm guessing a kill, a kill um, truck that then would bring a carcass to a facility for cut and wrap is how I'm gonna interpret that question. The talking to the companies, the truck itself will have a small cut and wrap place so we can do that on site um, depending on need. So if, if 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 we get a lot more need from our community than I expected, then um, we could also write in having a a permanent cooler spot, you know, to expand so we can hold more carcasses and stuff. So that's all going to be dependent on need. Mm -hmm. And yes, you could rent a porter potty. It's it it is possible. It add, that adds a lot of extra pieces to things, but um we, you know, obviously we'll work with that with the farmers, but, um, yeah. And yeah. Okay. 
Uh, thank you for that. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot going on in the chat. I'm trying to keep up and make sure we get everyone's kind of questions or um, thoughts addressed. Um, someone just said that there is a mobile pig processor, so we want to make sure we're working in collaboration and not necessarily competition. It seems like maybe that person's not USDA, but also I think it's always smart to chat with people in the area and um, making sure that you're not, you know, stepping on anyone's toes, but it seems like there's a lot of need in the region. Uh, let's see. Frisia offer a mobile unit. Okay, so this is an interesting question. So this person is saying that they've only seen Frisia having modular units that are permanently placed, but not necessarily a mobile unit. Is that the same information that you've had, or have you seen an actual mobile unit that goes from ranch to ranch? They have both. They have the module and the mobile. I can't share the exact details of the mobile stuff because it's a proprietary thing um so i couldn't just post that here uh but yeah they have a they do have those module units the four module ones those run seven hundred thousand dollars a piece um and then you can connect them together to grow and stuff it's nice because if you need to move you can it's, it's permanent but it's not permanent so like let's say in the future we needed to move it we could do that um so i do like if we needed to put a cooler area in or something um that module unit may not be a bad idea um, in case we need to have flexibility with it. Um, but they also mm -hmm. do a separate mobile unit as well. Okay. And then I think this may be our last question for you. Um, what are you doing to collect data and numbers to figure out your volumes for the feasibility study USDA needs? And I guess maybe I'll say, do you have a system for that? Like, are you surveying people or are you just uh, talking to people one-on-one -on -one via email and asking them questions? this point that's, that's I guess one of my last questions I, I meant to ask you um so I sent my email out there so people can directly respond to me and then I don't have the same listserv that the extension office and stuff does so I could build a uh survey to send out to people if that would that be better so I could get a better response there from my experience, it seems like there's a lot of interest and it might be easier to get the data um, in a more like succinct and standardized way with like, just like a Google form survey so that you can compare and contrast and it gathers it all for you. Um, that would be maybe my suggestion. I don't know if anyone else who's done any of this work has suggestions. Maybe Colette can speak to it. Yes, uh, Katie, if you were to do a Google form, which I think is a good idea, we would be happy to put an announcement and the link to that survey in our newsletter and ask people to share it. I think the other thing that I, I could definitely help with, uh, and I imagine others on this call, is if there was a social media post that you generated, so like a Facebook post or an Instagram that we could connect that to our social media as well as another opportunity to get the word out about the survey. And then I did want to say that Crystal Schwartz, who is actually on the call today, she did a survey about poultry. And I'm not sure if you wanted to um, maybe connect with Crystal or if Crystal has something that she would like to say about that survey that she did a year ago. Uh, yeah, actually, I was just writing that in the chat. Um, I need to find it. I believe I sent it to maybe uh, Iris or yourself, Colette. But um, yeah, it was like Spokane, Coeur d'Alene, and anyone who saw the post um, in the area, how many birds they annually wanted to process potentially, um, and their contact info. Awesome. And then I do see Megan Stark has her hand raised. Megan, if you want to come off mute and share. Sure. Um, sorry, my video is not on. It's not. It's been weird. Uh, so we're we're in the process of doing exactly this right Maybe now. She's gone. I don't see her at the top of my list anymore. Um, I know, I think she, Megan did ask the question about collecting data and numbers, so maybe that was what she wanted to say, but Megan, if you do want to um, unmute and speak, you're welcome to do that. Okay, can you so, hear me? Yeah. Hi. Okay. <laughs> um, 
so we're in, we're in the process of all of this right now. Um, and I, in case you guys do need um, an example or whatnot, we're actually in the middle of our, of our study right now with uh, U of I, um, the extension office here. And um, there's several different ways you can collect data. We kind of broke ours down down to you know species, how often going down to like, do they need it weekly, bi-weekly, monthly, blah, 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 blah. Um, breaking it down to the information that we would need to move forward on, on writing the feasibility study uh, where USDA would be happy with. Um, so I don't know, I mean, I can, I can get the survey or I can actually just, I'll just grab the link and drop it in here. And if you guys want, you're welcome to look at it. Um, if any of you guys are in Eastern Idaho or over on this side of the state, you're welcome to fill it out. <laughs> but uh, anyways, just more so like some information for you if you need some help. Awesome, thank you, Megan. And I, I did see that survey. I think Fair Idaho shared it out too. So if you could drop that in the chat, it would be great whether people wanna fill it out or use it as a reference point of the questions that um, should be asked in a survey. We also have some other people just making suggestions of different businesses to check out. I see Moses Lakes, Lopez Island, um, Bay Area Ranchers Co-op. So there's a lot of great info in the chat. And I think um, just to make sure we get through our other opportunities and some other conversations, I think we can move on unless Katie, there's anything else that you want to bring up or ask or seek support on, um, but I do welcome you to maybe drop your email in the chat again, since there's been so much chat activity now. So it's kind of top there for people. Um, and it seems like there's a lot of support and I really appreciate you um, taking this on and also how you're looking at it to be really led by the community need. I think that's a great way to move it forward. Uh, I just sent my email in there again, so everyone email me, and yeah, I will work on a Google survey um, and get that to you so we can get that out, and then once I have that back, I can start building the business plan and getting things moving that direction, so hey, exciting. Awesome. Thank you, Katie. Appreciate it, and thanks for being here and sharing this with us. I think there's a, a good opportunity in what you're working on. So our next um, thing that we wanted to talk about is this is kind of from a different angle, but it's a, a restaurateur in the Northern Idaho region who wants to buy more local food, including a lot of local meat and is struggling on finding sources for that. Um, they did recently purchase a warehouse and commercial kitchen space to store more products, um, also to process and do some value add things. Um, Katie Baker, Katie Baker is, is he here or do you want to speak on this for them? Yeah, I don't think Tobe Finch is here actually, uh, but I can speak to Tobe and he has 13 restaurants in Lewiston and he reached out to Fair Idaho because we're uniquely structured and that we represent producers and retailers. And one of our main jobs here at Fair is to really connect producers with retailers. Now, Tobe is getting a little frustrated just because of the increased cost of food um, and the supply chain disruptions. He was getting shorted product and he needs to get consistency. And plus he's like, we grow so much here in the state of Idaho and I want to source more local product. How can we make that happen? So we've actually been hosting round tables um, or really gatherings of farmers across the state of Idaho, linking them to Tobe to help make his dream a reality. It's a lofty goal, but I think we can do that um, where he can definitely source more local product. I will put my email, since Tobe's not here today, I will put my email again in the chat. Um, and then if you are interested in being a participant in our discussions and hoping in helping Happy Day Restaurant source more local product, please shoot me a quick email and then I'll make sure that you're on the next call that we host. Okay, thanks for that overview, Katie. So um, I guess the opportunity there is to send your information to Katie via email and she can help to facilitate the relationship building with this um, restaurateur. So if you have 
volume that you need to move, or if you have the ability to produce more livestock to meet the needs of a restaurant. If you like working with restaurants for carcass balancing, this might be a good opportunity for you all to um, find a new buyer in the region. And I think it's like a multi-restaurant, um, Lewiston based. Is that right, Katie Baker? Yeah. Yeah, it is. He's in Lewiston. Okay, great. And it looks awesome. like well, that Stephanie has her hand raised. Yeah. So my question is, is he looking for whole carcasses? Because again, without USDA processing, I can't sell him lamb cuts. I can only sell him entire carcasses. Yeah, so that's a he... that's a really great question. I can ask because they're building that facility with a commercial kitchen space. I can ask what, if they have a butcher in house and get back to you. If you shoot me a quick email, I'll connect you with Tobe and then we can go from there. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Yeah. And I'll plug one of the things that Fair Idaho, I know Katie's going to mention it later on in um, this conversation, but one of the things that Fair Idaho is going to be working on in the next um, six months or so is some uh, chef and buyer educational series to get them more comfortable with whole carcasses to help support what is currently available without those cut and wrapped facilities. So hopefully we can inspire some chefs and buyers to want to buy more full carcasses. Um, and that could be a way also to engage more of the producers on this call with some of these purchases. Um, and I'll let Katie share more shortly. I think we're gonna move on to the next slide now. Um, and this is more of not a specific person, but some other conversations that have come up around this. Um, we, we know there's gonna be some more funding coming online for these upgrading um, and expanding facilities. So there is this potential interest of if there's a custom exempt facility that exists, are they interested in becoming a USDA inspected facility? If so, there's some funding available. Um, another idea, and I think it came up in the chat a little bit about these kind of cooperative and co-ownership models for one producer, or one entrepreneur to take on a facility build out might be a lot, but can we collaborate and cooperate together to build some different models? And then one other thing that came up in our um, Palouse Clearwater Food Summit conversation was a little different than what we've been talking about so far, but I thought it was interesting. Um, and I wanted to mention it that this, this producer had a lot of success hosting these on farm homestead slaughter and processing courses. Um, and they seemed like that was a really interesting way to diversify their enterprises, bring people to the farms. Um, and when you can't send your poultry to a USDA processor, can you get customers to come on the farm and process the chicken there and take it home and eat it? And maybe you actually even get more um, bang for your buck when you do that. So um, those are just some things that I wanted to put out there. We can talk about them or if anyone has an opportunity that we haven't mentioned that they want to bring up. You may do so. I see Colette's hand raised, so I will stop talking and pass it over to her. Thanks, Amy. Um, Art King with Four Friends is on today. And Art, I'm wondering if you could talk to us about your USDA slaughter and processing options and also your organic option. So I'm not sure if you have the- There we go. As soon oh, as I figure right. out how to unmute this thing. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Bear with me. I've been, I've had a heck of a cold here lately, so it might be a little hard to understand. Um, yeah, our USDA, we just started doing USDA inspected slaughter in uh, August of 2021. We've been a USDA inspected processing facility since uh, 2012 when we first opened. We would have people like the University of Idaho, Washington State University, Pure Country Harvest. We've gone as far as Napa, Idaho, or even Springfield, Oregon to pick up inspected uh, carcasses that belong to other customers, brought them back to our plant to process. <clears throat> Just a little bit of a side note, uh, in the conversation about restaurants and the restaurants having an in-house butcher and that kind of thing, 
that's all well and good, but those animals are still going to have to be slaughtered under inspection. So that is that's the that has always been probably the largest stumbling block for uh, the ranchers and producers to get their meat into commerce is the slaughter portion. So that's why we went to the uh, uh, inspected slaughter. Uh, we purchased a, a trailer, but a trailer large enough to accommodate all the requirements for USDA and to be able to do enough animals to make it worthwhile. The trailer has become so large and cumbersome that uh, it's not practical to take it to farm to farm. So we ha have a ranch that we uh, ask the, at plus the requirements of humane handling and uh, all the requirements that the site where you're gonna slaughter uh, under inspection, all those requirements again are so cumbersome that it's uh, very difficult to go from farm to farm. So uh, we have a ranch where we have our pens just outside of town about 10 minutes and uh, we take the trailer out there in the morning. We uh, harvest the animals, bring them back in the evening, unload them in our processing plant, and uh, you know, repeat the next day. It's worked very well, probably better than we anticipated or uh, actually kind of a victim of our own success. We, we are already full for the year. I mean, we have very few spots available. Uh, <clears throat> so we are looking already at how to expand and offer a greater amount of our services. We are, we do a certain amount of custom. We do regular USDA inspected slaughter and processing. Um, as you said, we are an organic, we're, we are certified through the Idaho Department of Agriculture as a USDA inspected organic slaughter and processing facility. Uh, we also um, have just recently verbally been uh, certified to do the uh, voluntary inspected animals such as bison, elk, deer, yak, those kind of things um, <clears throat> as a slaughter and processing facility. So we kind of, in large animals, we, we kind of got it covered, a little bit of everything. We do not do poultry yet, but uh, I wouldn't be surprised if that's not too far down the road. Um, that's a little bit about us. I, I agree with everybody that it is a need. It is a huge need that, uh, that is really difficult to fill right now. And uh, it has to do with two things, money and people to, uh, to train that you can uh, uh, count on to get the job done. Wastewater management, uh, I see it. There's, I, I got a whole bunch of questions here. Uh, wastewater management. Our trailer has a holding tank in it. It's self-contained. We have fresh water in. We have a holding tank just like you would an RV. Bring it back to the, uh, uh, we recover the blood outside the trailer, uh, but then when we bleed the animal, but then uh, the, all the other wastewater that we generate inside the trailer, um, we have a holding tank, bring it back to the shop, and then we dump it into the, just the municipal sewer system. It's the same water as if we would uh, be generating inside our building. And fresh water is an issue as well. We made the mistake of using well water one time out there because we ran out. Oh my gosh, the hopes, it cost us a couple thousand dollars in testing of the carcasses that we harvested that day and uh, the water that we used to make sure that it met the requirements of USDA. So it did, we were fortunate enough, but had the carcasses on hold for almost their entire aging process. Plus, like I said, we spent probably $2,000 in testing to get those animals released. So freshwater is a big deal. Um, you know, I, I don't wanna sound like a negative Nancy, but the easy part is getting trailer built. Then the difficult times come. All the HACCP plans and all the intricacies of that, plus the, uh, the sites that you're going to slaughter in and uh, just keeping everybody happy is a tremendous. Uh, we have one person eight hours a day, five days a week, and that's all they deal with is USDA inspected slaughter and processing paperwork. So it's, it is a big deal. It's not something that's gonna just 
boom, you're done in six months and you're ready to rock and roll. It, it's not going to happen. Unless you're a lot, well, it's not going to be harder to be a lot smarter than me, but unless you've got uh, more resources than we had to work with, uh, it, it'll, it's, it's doable, but it's going to be a big job to get another, especially a mobile processor in the field. Thank you so much for sharing. I think you um, just sharing what you've gone through, what you're looking forward to. I think it's really interesting. We did have one other question come in. Um, it's from Megan Stark, who's in the process or going to be building an organic certification for facility. She's wondering if you can share your weekly capacity for beef and bison at your existing facility. Right now we do, we could do about 40 head a week. We're not doing that right now because at the other end, on the cutting end, we don't have the people in the in the shop uh, to cut that many a week. So it's uh, yeah, you so you, you've got both sides, both sides of the coin to work with there. <clears throat> when we do organic, that's all we do is organic. That particular time frame, either one day, one week, whatever it takes. We try not to mix our organic work with our um, non-organic work each day. Okay. So I think that answers Megan's follow-up question, like how often do you kill organic? And that varies depending on um, the customer base that is seeking organic, it sounds like. Yeah, right now we just have one customer who do about 40 head of beef for him for a year. That's kind of where we're at, but we'd be happy to add more if we needed to. Mm -hmm. I have and, a quick, uh, yeah. yeah, I see that question about the type of workforce. Um, we, uh, we've struggled. It's, it's hard to find people that want to work as hard as a butcher meat cutter does. Um, we find it easier to find a good person, a hard worker, and then we train them to do the job than it is to find experience because experience is dying off on us. There was a big gap when this was not a popular uh, occupation and all those old guys are retiring and uh, it's hard to find uh, experience to help. Okay. Um, I think there's someone is posting some good articles about the shortage in inspectors and veterinarians and processor processing labor force. So I think that's definitely a big um, problem. I don't know if we have anyone on the call who has an opportunity to fill it. I know, I think uh, Dr. Phil Bass from U of I is on the call. So maybe he could jump in and share anything that he's working on. Um, Megan is wondering if you're comfortable sharing this, if you would, what wages are you paying your various different employees? Uh, yeah, no, not at all. Uh, depending on your, your, what your job is and what your level of experience is, we're anywhere from 16 to $20 an hour right now. Okay, thank you. Um, and I'm wondering, Art, just to kind of follow up, I know you said you'd be looking at expanding um, your existing operation, potentially getting into poultry. Is there anything that the people on this call can do to support you in bringing that to fruition? Or is that just like you're working on it and you'll get to it as soon as time and workforce allows? Uh, everybody send me a thousand dollars and we will uh, have this thing going just in a few months. Now that's, that's the biggest thing. Right now we are looking for a financial partner to move into the state of Idaho, out of Washington, into the state of Idaho and build a new um, uh, six or 7,000 square foot facility where we have everything under one roof and uh, we can increase our production quite easily by 40 to 50%. Mm -hmm. I, said, okay. I said that wrong. We could almost double what we're doing now if we had everything under one roof and it was in a facility that was better suited for what we're doing. Okay. And then I have a kind of question on that. Are you looking into the various USDA funding mechanisms that are either online currently or are going to be coming online in the next four to six months? Uh, we have not, but I have a note here that I'm to uh, contact some of you nice ladies. 
about uh, what is out there and, and how, uh, how we can apply for it and what, what's the best way to go about doing that. Yep, yep, and Stephanie put in, sounds like an awesome project for the guaranteed load loan program. I think so too, and it also seems like um, while they haven't released the program info yet on the gap filling, it seems like because you're already in operation and you see that you can't fill your existing demand, that there's that gap financing that might be applicable as well maybe some grant dollars too to help offset some of that repayment cost. Um, so I think that is definitely reach out to us and we can see how we can support you in that um, and navigating that USDA world because it's complicated, but you know we definitely want people to take advantage of those federal dollars as they're available. Um, bring some of that money into Idaho and help support the industry. Yes, so, I agree. Yeah, all right. Well, I think um, Art, if I invite you to follow up with anything or any last thoughts you have. And if not, we can um, move forward in the conversation. I think we've got one or two more slides to cover. The only thing I can say is, um, you know, it's not a big secret. So if we can be of any help at all to anybody looking to uh, provide more services, we're always available to tell you what our experiences have been over the relatively short time we've been in business. And, uh, you know, we, we're always here to help people. Awesome. Thank you, Art. Um, people are wondering if you would be willing to put your contact info, your email in the chat so people can reach out to you. Yep, I'll do it right now. Thank you so much. And thanks for um, talking about your business and what you're working on and how people can connect with you. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Okay, I think now um, I'll give like one last opportunity for anyone else that wants to voice something they're working on or something they need support with related to the conversation we've had today that you can um, unmute and share or share to the chat and we can discuss it. And going once, going twice. Moving on, but Amy, feel free. To, Amy, oh, yeah. I think that Josiah has his hand raised and wanted to speak. Okay, great. Thank you. I can't see hands because I'm sharing the screen. So thank you for pointing that out. And yeah, Josiah, please jump on and share away. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, I own a USDA processing facility for poultry in Southern Idaho. J Bar Poultry Processing. Some of you might know about that place. And I am definitely wanting to expand, if possible, up in your guys' area um, to help the poultry side out. And I and so I don't know how best um, we can work together on that, but I would love to work with you guys to help make poultry a reality um, in that area. Um, I've gone through the whole USDA has a plan having system for all that. And I understand all that. It's definitely the biggest hurdle, like everybody says, um, to making a processing facility um, effective and operational. So um, yeah, I just wanna share that, share the information that I am definitely wanting to work up there. I'll work with you guys, help that become a reality. Um, so yeah. That's exciting news, Josiah. Thanks for sharing that. And I will, um, I don't see any immediate questions in the chat. So I will ask you, like, do you, how do you envision that? Do you want a, a satellite facility that's similar to the one you operate in Southern Idaho that you would operate and manage and hire staff for? Or do you want to be like a mentor to someone who wants to do something similar in that region? Like what level of involvement do you want to offer to that region? Um, ideally, I would like to do a satellite style facility that um, was um, followed the basic plans of what we're doing down here and um, that we know works and um, manage that um, with people that want that need up there. Um, I'm not against, um, being an assistant or, 
a mentor to somebody that wants to develop a facility. Um, but I would be the most comfortable um, doing more of a satellite facility. But of course, it all comes down to funding right now. I know the needs out there. We personally are booked out already for next year down here, and I could do more than two or three times um, the amount of poultry that we're going to get through this year. We're trying to get an expansion funded down here right now. Um, so I know the needs out there. Um, um, so yeah. Um, okay. I, that, I think that's really good to know. Um, I, uh, I, I'm wondering, like, when you talk about funding, are you looking for investors? Are you tapping into some of these federal dollars, both and so something I, else? Yeah, I would. The federal dollars, I've been trying to get someone to work with, um, and I have one person working on it to figure that world out because I don't understand it fully. Um, so yeah, okay. any information I can get or help there, I would love to um, help the farmers out in this region with better processing by getting some of that money in here. Um, but besides that, I am working with a, a more of a conventional loan, um, but that hasn't all gone through yet, but that's what I've been working on. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I would offer that you could reach out to me and we could chat about some of the federal options. Also, um, the investment fund that I lead is interested in funding processing mm -hmm. facilities. Um, so if that's something you're interested in and anyone on the call, okay. definitely connect with me. Um, I will now open it up. Does anyone have any um, things that they want to offer support to Josiah on bringing that satellite facility up to Northern Idaho? Not yet. Okay. Well, it sounds like there would be customers for you. Um, so. Yeah. Yeah. And the one thing I would say is poultry and a red meat slaughter beef, you know, lamb, pork. It's hard to do that in the same facility because they run under two separate HASA plans. Mm -hmm. um, and you can do it, but you have to have a lot of dividing lines and your whole USDA inspection and focus in the poultry world. Um, um, so yeah, if I can mm -hmm. help there, that's what I know. And um, I'm not, there's a way to do it together and I'm not gonna discourage anybody from that. I just know that it's a complicated part to do both inside the same building. Yeah, that's so. been the research that I've done too. And I've seen like where you would have two modular units next to each other. So they're operated mm -hmm. under the same business entity, but not actually housed in the same facility. Um, but sounds like maybe but, there is a way to do it. It just takes a little and, more tweaking to those HACCP plans. And if somebody is into, you know, working on the red meat side and they want to work with me and I bring the poultry and oversee the poultry side with their business somehow, you know, I'm open to things okay. like that too. If there's a way okay. to kind of work together. So. Okay, cool. So um, it seems like maybe Katie Swant, there might be a connection there to collaborate. If you get into the poultry side of things, maybe a J bar poultry satellite facility at the same um, space that you're going to do the mobile processing for bison and cattle and pigs and goats and sheep. You know, I, I got your email this morning, Desire. Uh, so you have mine. I'll talk to you. Um, so once I get responses from people, I was kind of hoping poultry would fill in the gap for the off season from the beef so we could keep our employees paid. So maybe we can work something out and do some, I'll, I'll talk to you off, you know, after this. So mm -hmm. it's good to know there's some experience out there. Oh, good. Yep. Give me a call or email me anytime. All right. Well, I think, um, I'm taking notes just in case anyone's wondering why I keep looking down and scribbling. Um, <laughs> I think that covers a lot of what we wanted to chat about. I do see Colette's note in the chat about um, 
conversations around efficient facilities so that wages can be competitive. I think that's definitely something to take into account. Um, competitive wages are necessary in the climate that we're in to get that workforce um, filling the needs. Uh, so I think, sorry if you heard that, that was my puppy making noises. Um, I, sorry, I'm seeing some stuff in the chat. So I just wanna make sure I'm following that. Katie, is that a link to the Fair Idaho Roundtable? Okay. Yeah, yeah. That's a link on our YouTube channel to that other roundtable that Colette was mentioning. Great, thank you for that. So yeah, that was a really lively discussion. Um, Megan Stark, who was on this call, she participated in that. She's also on our ag and farm committee, and she's a really helpful voice to have at the table. Um, she seems very interested in supporting people that are working on this. So I would just put Megan on the spot to say that she's probably open to chatting with any of you if you wanna talk about some of those competitive wages thing on there. Um, and I think that will kind of wrap us up to talking about Fair Idaho and ways to further engage with our work and receive support. So I'm gonna to go to my next slide and let Katie take it away. Yeah, thanks so much. So I just wanted to talk about what Fair Idaho is because we're a relatively new organization. And, you know, I wanna just mention that we really represent independent food and beverage businesses. We have about 260 Fair Idaho members across the state. So we've grown really quickly. We are born out of the pandemic. We realized that there was a need to support independent food and beverage businesses with advocacy, connecting, and really promoting everything that Idaho has to offer. So. I do want to mention that there's a we are a membership based organization. We kept our membership rates for farmers really low because we know that they're the heart of where our food comes from and we ultimately would love to help our farmers and ranchers be successful. And so when we look at our advocacy work because our job is to really advocate on behalf of our members and what does that look like? It really means heading to these roundtables, seeing what folks have to say, and then listening to uh, the voice of our members and seeing what they're struggling with and how we can help as an organization and really find a clear direction. So one of the things I noticed about this last year in terms of our advocacy work, when I was meeting with um, our Idaho delegation, like a senator's office, they would oftentimes ask me, how many members do you have that represents this um, issue that you're currently coming to us about, whether that be restaurants or livestock processing. And so that collective voice really does matter in terms of our advocacy work. And then our, our job is really to connect our producers with our retailers to create, create a more resilient food system. Um, and that's the hope. So like Tope Finch has you know, we, he's a restaurateur that wants to source more local products. So that's the direction that we're headed going forward is really building um, those connections and ultimately helping our food system thrive. And then telling the stories of food farming and beverage in the state of Idaho. I think telling those stories is what helps consumers and retailers, meaning your co-ops, your farmers markets, your restaurants want to source more local product when they hear those stories. So that's our job. And then um, we did hire this last year, Roger Batt. He's a lobbyist. He's well um, ingrained in that ag in agriculture. And so he's been helping us advocate on behalf of our members at a state level. And really, my job is to talk about the issues that our members are facing. And so I'll be speaking to the Idaho House Agriculture Affairs Committee in March, among other groups. I think I have three scheduled events that same week. Um, like Amy mentioned, we have the USDA promotion, local foods promotion grant. So we're really an organization that tries to think outside of the box, like we've identified this as an issue. Let's say livestock processing. How can we have a multifaceted approach to solve this issue? And one of those is like, how about we create resources on our website for our members that um, will be traveling the state and then hosting classes on butchering those whole multi-species animals 
And how can we train farmers, chefs to do this in-house? We do have restaurants that actually get the whole carcass and break it down. And what's interesting about what we're currently facing in this environment is that they say we're actually saving money by not only sourcing local, but breaking down the animal in house. And it's pretty crazy the amount that they save. So our hope is like hosting these classes in terms of education and then providing video resources uh, for our members to utilize well, going well into the future. And so um, I don't normally do this, but we would love for to just encourage you to join Fair Idaho. Like I said, it's $75 annually. And we, when we go to advocate on the issues facing our farmers, then we can say, hey, look, we have, we're representing 60, 70 farmers, and they're all struggling with this shared concern. And so um, I'll put the, the link to our Fair Idaho page for you all to reference, and you can check out the membership benefits. I didn't go into those, but anyway, um, thanks so much for considering and joining us today, because I think these roundtables help shape the direction of our organization and our future and our advocacy work. So thank you. And oh, let me know if you have any quick questions. I know we'll probably end here soon, but um, oh, thanks, Megan. I appreciate it. Yeah, that was a nice endorsement from Megan, one of our Fair Idaho members and our Farm and Ag Committee member. So people are interested in being more involved than just a Fair Idaho member and you wanna be involved with our farm and ag work, you're welcome to join that. We would love to have you involved. We would really love a North Idaho representative. We've got some good reps from Southern Idaho, but have not yet had anyone from North Idaho join that's a producer. So if you're a producer and you're interested in that type of work, please join monthly meetings. There's not a ton of legwork to do, um, but show up to those monthly meetings and be available as a resource as Katie and I look at um, kind of this uh, advocacy work that we're doing and resource work that we're doing. We like to have that in, in uh, the, the feedback and bouncing off ideas off of producers throughout the state of Idaho. Um, I, and I will just say, if anyone has any questions or things they want to ask, whether it's about Fair Idaho or other things that came up in the conversation, we will continue to be on the call for, I, I think, 10 more minutes at the most if people want to. Um, is there any value to the organization for a processor to be a member? I don't know, Katie, if you want to tackle that, I would say absolutely it would benefit us um, to think about ways that we can support processors more as we work on these different agenda items or advocacy positions to know that we are hearing from the processor side. We've struggled with getting processors. They're just so busy to engage with us and questions that we have. So having a processor join would definitely allow us to have more, um, more cohesive thoughts on the things that we're thinking of. Because yes, we want to benefit producers, but processors are an important player in our entire food system. Katie, yes. you wanna add anything? Yeah, I agree with that. And, um, you know, we definitely, as we're working through this, and I would say what 90, Amy, you can attest to this, about 95% of our phone phone discussions when we're meeting via Zoom with our farm and ag committee is talking about livestock processing. So yes, um, there is a benefit to becoming a Fair Idaho member if you are a processor. Like I mentioned in the chat, you're just a critical part of the food chain and we need your voice, that's for sure. And I, I, if I, I would uh, love to answer any further questions too, or if you want to just shoot me a quick email and we could set up a time as well. Yeah, thanks again, Megan, for another awesome um, pitch for us. It's, it is a great networking opportunity as well. Um, so you get a lot of different benefits. I know my organization is a member of Fair Idaho, and we take advantage of the nice healthcare. We're a really small nonprofit, so we don't have healthcare services. Fair Idaho offers nice healthcare, which is really affordable, and we get telehealth services, prescriptions delivered to our door, um, 
labs, all sorts of things. And that's been a really great perk for our small organization. Yeah, I didn't go into that, but member benefits is something that we're working on. How do we create member benefits for all the sectors that we represent? So, and that, that link that I put into the chat is um we'll list all those member benefits and it's growing really quickly we're now looking at ancillary um, insurance options like vision dental and life insurance as well and i just sent yeah. out a survey to our fair idaho members about health insurance so really when you go into the hospital what are you covered for so thanks katie and um, I think with that, I'm not seeing any other questions come in or hands raised. So just again, thank you all so much for joining us. I hope this conversation was fruitful. It seems like we have a lot of good connection points that came about from this. So looking forward to seeing how things progress. I dropped my email in the chat. Please reach out um, if you have any questions and if you need support on navigating the funding. Like I said before, you're now going to be on Fair Idaho's newsletter list. So you'll know as soon as those USDA programs are announced. We're expecting that later this spring and summer. Um, thank you, Colette and Mackenzie, for being on the call and helping to outreach to the producers in your network in Northern Idaho. And, um, Western Washington, I think, or Eastern Washington, sorry. A um, lot of thank yous, great meeting coming through. So thank you all. And we're looking forward to how this conversation unfolds. Yeah, thank you, Amy and Katie. Yeah, Thanks thank you. Me. Have a great day. Yeah, yeah thanks everyone. Yeah.